Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Today we are looking at different types of oregano. We learn how to paint turf grass. We head down south to visit a garden center in Clarita, Oklahoma. And finally, Jim Schreffler joins us to share some news. Often when we talk about adding herbs into the garden, we mention plants such as basil and oregano. But if you have bought plants and you go to the nursery or especially online catalogs, and when you buy those plants, there's a lot more cultivars or varieties on the market than just the regular basil and oregano. So today we're going to look at five different hybrids of oregano that you might want to consider adding to your garden. The first one we're gonna look at is called Calateri. You can see it back here. Now most of your oreganos are gonna have sort of a spade-like leaf to them um, that's fairly small, about the tip of your pinky. Um, however, this Calateri is a Greek oregano um, and it has especially been cultivated in Greece for its high oil content. And so it really is used commercially for an oregano, a Greek oregano. Now you can see if you do let it go to flower, you're gonna get these nice um, small sort of hops-like flowers that sort of cascade down as they transition from green to that mauve color. Now this particular one, Calateri, is known for its flavor that it can add in the, in the culinary dish. However, you wanna make sure to get the best uh, oils to actually harvest it prior to its flowering. And again, that will keep it from producing those flowers. So again, you wanna think about what you're using it for, whether you wanna ornamentally or you're wanting it for that culinary purpose. Now, if Greek oregano is not your thing, you might consider adding Italian oregano into your garden. So you can see here, we have it in front of us. The flower is a little bit different. It's a little more of a pale uh, yellow, pale green um, with white flowers. However, now when we're talking about the flavor, hardy marjoram is also a name for this Italian oregano. So you might find it under both of those names. Now, it is a hybrid between Greek oregano and sweet marjoram. Sweet marjoram is also a genus of oregano. So they are related. However, we know in the culinary world, we see those herbs being used in different recipes. So the nice thing about this Italian oregano or hearty marjoram is it can kind of play both of those flavors in your recipe. So that might be one you wanna add if you're looking to kind of combine that flavor. The other thing about this is it tends to hold up longer in your recipes when you're cooking too. So um, if you're doing a long stew or something like that, you might consider that. Now in front of us, we have one that is a little bit more ornamental um, and less uh, used for culinary purposes. And the reason why, even though you still will have a little bit of that fragrance when you touch it, it doesn't have the high oil content that is often desired in cooking. So what we have here is called Kent's Beauty um, that's down in front of us. Now this is a little bit smaller. You can see it's kind of getting uh, crowded out by some of the others, but it will make a nice cascading display. Um, and what's nice about these flowers, which it's really grown for more an ornamental purpose, are they almost really resemble those hops flowers um, as they have these calyx that change from kind of the leaves of the green color down into this mauve color um, and have a nice uh, lime yellow in the center of them. So these will just cascade. Not only do they have beautiful flowers, but what makes them perfect for rock gardens and containers is the fact that this is a very drought tolerant plant that likes well-drained soil. So it's an ideal plant for that ornamental purpose. Now, if you're wanting to mix the culinary with the ornamental, a plant you might want to consider is Bristol's Cross. 
Um, this is Bristol's Cross Oregano, and you can see it has a little bit more of an upright structure with its flowers. You will be able to harvest the leaves for your uh, cooking. However, at the same time, you're also going to get these beautiful flowers that come on it. Now we have cut this plant back. So if you didn't cut it back, you can see that it will grow a little bit larger and these will start to kind of flop over a little bit more. But as you look at this, again, it sort of has that um, trailing uh, calyx where you can see the flowers continue to open on them. Um, on this wiry stem that's kind of got a burgundy color to it. So it's a nice addition to either the herb or the ornamental garden. Now you can see as I'm here with this, I'm trying not to get stung by any bees when I'm touching these plants because not only are they great for the kitchen garden or the ornamental garden, but they're also a perfect addition for the pollinator garden as well with their tubular flowers. Now we have one more oregano that I want to show you that is often called oregano, but really isn't an oregano at all. So all of the oreganos that we have mentioned are in the genus Origanum. Um, and so they are definitely considered oregano. However, we have another one that is often mentioned as Cuban oregano. And this actually is not in that same genus. So it's not a true oregano. It in fact is in the genus Plectranthus. Um, this particular one is a Cuban oregano and there is variegated versions of this, but this particular one has kind of got more of the fuzzy, softer leaf to it. It is used for um, culinary purposes, so you can use it often with some of those meatier dishes, um, maybe some wild game or some lamb, because it does have a very strong, potent uh, flavor that can be overpowering. So be careful and use it sparingly. Now, all the other true oreganos are hardy in Oklahoma. Most of them are hardy from zones six to about 10 or 11. However, Cuban oregano is tropical um, and is not hardy in Oklahoma. So if you're looking to incorporate this into your garden, make sure to buy it as an annual and plant it regularly each season in your garden. So those are just five oreganos that you might consider adding in your ornamental or herb garden. Today we're here at the OSU Turf Research Center adjacent to the Botanic Garden to talk a little bit about a unique management practice involving paints. So you may be familiar with uh, paints that are used to create logos and other features on football fields and sports fields, but today the, the paint we're talking about is actually used in a little bit different kind of context. It's actually uh, typically green or some shade of blue or green and is used not to create some sort of unique design, but to help perhaps mask injury, to help transition from a dormant period to an actively growing period, or in some other way to kind of spruce up an otherwise drab looking turf grass. So these different green paints are, are typically used in our golf community and can be a really nice asset and a fairly inexpensive approach to kind of extending their season either in the fall or getting a head start on the spring. We have quite a few nice days in March and April where folks may want to get out and play golf, but you know the Bermuda grass or other warm season turf grasses might not quite have woken up from winter. And so using a little bit of green paint can sometimes give that golf course the edge it needs in the marketplace or uh, make their membership happy and give them something to look at that's green and appealing uh, and really improve the quality of the product. So I'm standing on a uh, research trial that we've been conducting for a couple of years to look at how do we time application of these paints, how often do we have to reapply to create a certain level of greenness or, or aesthetic quality, and then um, you know, how some of these different products differ in their longevity or need for reapplication. So if we take a closer look at this uh, research plot, we have several different kinds of products 
And they, they were sprayed probably about a month ago, uh, which would have put it around a March 1st type application. And so they're, they're kind of on the very last of their, um, of, of, of their performance. Um, but we can still see down here where we were untreated, where there's still quite a bit of dormant Bermuda grass, whereas adjacent to it, we can get a little bit better uh, uh, green, greenness overall. And certainly when we think about you know, folks driving by or, or, or playing golf, it creates um, a, nice, a nice attractive target for them. So we know that the golfing community likes to use these products. Um, how, how could you in your home landscape try to use these products? And I think that for most folks, they could use it in a similar manner where they're trying to extend, say, that season of greenness in the fall or maybe get a jump start on the spring or they could spray throughout winter. However, more likely you might find it useful to use these products to kind of spruce things up for an event. You know, so maybe you have a birthday party or, or some other kind of event where you'd like to have a nice green landscape and these products might be able, be able to suit that need. Now when thinking about that, you, you need to kind of think about what it takes to paint any kind of surface. If you're going to paint your house or any other sort of surface, it needs to be uniform and it can be messy. And so paying attention to non-target sites like your driveway or a curb can be challenging, but nevertheless it, is, it can be done. Um, and, and give you that, that green product you're looking for. So what we find when we're making these applications in the fall, it's usually recommended to make an application uh, a couple of weeks before that first, that first frost of the year, and then make that application two weeks later. And so those two applications a lot of times can give you a reasonable amount of performance on up to say Christmas or so. If you wanna continue applying throughout winter, a lot of these products will have a recommendation and they might range from every two to four or even eight weeks depending on essentially what kind of product it is. Is it, is it really more of just a dye or a colorant or is it really a true paint that has resins and things that make it last a lot longer? And, and so you'll need to look at each individual product to make that determination. On the back end, uh, we find that with about every four weeks of application, we can, we can make that last application of the year around March 1. And then that usually brings us close to the spring green up period when we would see active growth of our Bermuda grass. Other things to think about when making an application of paint are things like the weather or how much traffic the site might get. These, you know, particularly things like extended periods of rainfall or a lot of, of foot traffic might uh, encourage or, or, or increase the, the, the rate that these products um, deteriorate in the environment. We all know Oklahoma weather is, is very unpredictable. And so if you have an event in your backyard, paint might be a viable option that can help spruce up the landscape and provide you that uh, attractive green lawn color. Today I'm excited that we are down in southeastern Oklahoma, just outside a tiny little town named Clarita. And we are at Clarita's Greenhouse and Market, and joining us today is Eli Schrock. Eli, thank you so much for having us down here. I know a couple of years ago we did a segment with you about your moms, and I missed out on that. So I had to make sure I came down here and visited with you myself. So it's a beautiful nursery that you have here. Tell us a little bit about how it's been a crazy year. Um, with the pandemic and everything. Tell us a little bit about how that's affected the nursery industry and what you're seeing customers wanting these days. Oh, uh, it, uh, overall it's affected the nursery in a, in a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, supplies were limited. That, that was a, a bad, a downside of it was getting supplies, getting right. potting soil, getting pots. <laughs> uh, but the demand was, was really up. That, I'd say that's a good thing that came out of the pandemic was yeah. People are gardening. Yeah, they're at their homes and, yes, yeah. and looking and, at their backyards. Yes, all the and they would bring their children oh. and, and they would pick out, you know, the children say, oh, oh I love cucumbers. Let's do cucumbers. Uh, a lot of these were first time gardeners, too. Wow. And uh, 
So it was it was a good thing. It was an experience. It was kind of hair raising. <laughs> we we were overwhelmed, definitely. And what are you finding that there are? Is it you mentioned cucumbers? Are they after the vegetables or more the ornamentals? Are you seeing a trend there? Uh, the, it's definitely trending towards vegetables. But now they did uh, buy a lot of ornamentals. You know, okay. regardless how how vegetable intention they were, they just couldn't resist. Uh, let's plant some flowers, and, and that's a good thing too. Yeah, you know, you if anything, need... it brings the pollinators in yes, for those yes, uh, vegetables. And, mm -hmm. So what else, I know you have a lot of succulents around uh -huh. here, and I've heard that that's pretty popular. Yes. Um, are you finding that there is a certain demographic that is after that, that succulent collection? Oh yes, uh, younger, uh, anybody over 50 is not very interested in the succulents. Okay. They, maybe they've been there, done that, I don't know. Uh -huh. But uh, the younger crowd is definitely into the succulents and into odd stuff. Okay, and it looks like you've got a few. I know we're familiar with string of bananas, but you uh -huh. showed me one uh, uh, that looks a little similar. Tell me about that it, one. It's, it's a string of dolphins, <laughs> and it, it does look like that. It I does, mean, it, it does. Just, uh, and uh, young people, girls especially, boys are kind of, you know, but uh, yes, young people just love that string of dolphins. And of course, you complement it with string of peas and some of yes. the others as well. And then mm -hmm. uh, dragon fruit. I, I recognize that one. That's a fun yeah. plant. Yes, it is. It's, uh, uh, it, it needs to go inside in the winter, but that was given to me by a uh, oriental lady. Uh, her husband is a professor at Tish. What is that? Oh, M MIT, Murray at yeah. Tish Domingo? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. and, uh huh. And she grows it, and she just drags it into her garage in the winter time, and and back out. And she's showed me pictures of, like bushels of dragon fruit. Wow! Wow! And, uh, so I'm hoping I can get some dragon fruit. I think it is popular in the Asian markets and stuff like that. Yes. So, but a unique plant to grow if you've got space to bring it in. Yes. And if you don't, you also have a lot of dish gardens. It looks like something yes. that would work for that centerpiece in yes. their, in a house. Yes. We Very do. nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us a little bit too, because I've noticed that you've got a lot of natives. Are you seeing that a lot of people are going towards that with the asclepias uh, and? Yes and no. Uh, more the natives are more like my thing. Okay. I encourage people, and and there's a lot of uh, of people doing natives, but more the younger crowd, especially, they want instant gratification. Natives are not always that, you know. Uh, but they do have a season too. Yes, where they, look they have kind a of season, <laughs> and and a lot of times in the season when they're when in the planting season, they look kind of uh, wimpy. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you can convince them, I mean, they're a lot of them will buy it. Yeah. And the more experienced gardeners are more going for for that and the people that plant pollinator gardens okay. they're they're really going for the okay. natives. Well if anybody's ever seen the Asclepias blooming and I know you got some passion vine and that yeah. looks tropical even though you've got the native perennial one yeah. uh, and then also the the uh, hardy poinsettia which is a native mm -hmm. and again a lot of times we think poinsettia being tropical mm -hmm. so well, Eli, thank you so much for sharing your greenhouse, and I know you've got a big market inside that we're going to explore a little bit, but I would encourage anybody to stop by and check this place out if you're near Clarita, and thank you for letting us join you today. You're welcome. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Jim Schreffler. Uh, I'm area extension horticulturist working in Southeast Oklahoma with Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service. And we're here at the West Watkins Research and Extension Center this morning uh, here in Atoka County, looking at a, a trial of a, of a uh, winter squash variety. It, it's actually a winter, it's actually an heirloom squash that is, that is, uh, that is uh, an heirloom of the Choctaw Nation people. So it's kind of that this particular squash that we're that we're uh, looking at is uh, is thought to have have been uh, probably come from Central America and eventually moved its way up into North America into the into what's now the United States, of course, 
and, and it's been held by the by the by the uh, Native Americans of the Choctaw Nation. There may be other nation, maybe other uh, Native American groups also. So, so what, we've been doing some work with the with the Choctaw Nation to help them, just provide a little support in their efforts to develop this as as a crop for for their, for farmers, modern day farmers. The uh, one of the ways that that it probably hit, traditionally would have been grown was using the three sisters, what they call the three sisters farming system, where you grow each of uh, squash and corn and, and a legume, probably a bean, all, all together. And the, each of those, uh, in a kind of mixed cropping, the, uh, the corn provides some support for the vining, the beans and the squash vines to grow on. The squash, the large squash leaves, as you can see, they shade the ground pretty good. So that would help uh, reduce the, present, pre help prevent the weeds from growing and maybe conserve moisture from the soil surface and, and those sort of things. So what we're doing here, is, this is a trial actually where we're trying to figure out what would be the best plant spacing. You know, for, for 10 feet a row, how many plants did you plant there to produce the best yields and the best fruit size and those sort of things. So, so that's what this is here. And we, our treatments are actually uh, either, uh, per 10 feet a row, either two, four, six, or eight plant squash plants. And we can see over here we have a plot where we had just two plants per 10 feet. And then right here we have a plant, uh, a, a plot where the plants are much closer together and there's eight plants per 10 feet a row. So uh, when the fruit ripen, it, it, again, it's a winter squash, so it, it's, a, it, it's squashed and it matures, it gets pretty firm. Here we have a, a mature one. And now this is kind of just set here for looks, but actually this fruit was harvested a year ago, or nearly a year ago, in September of, of last year. So that gives you an idea of what the fruit look, would look like. They, they might be sometimes a little bigger, sometimes a little smaller. But, uh, but again, it's, uh, this has just been sitting indoors uh, in, in, in my office for, since it was harvested, still nice and firm. So, so it's a very good, uh, has good storability. So you get an idea, very attractive, but also very nutritious. And I won't cut it open, but the fruit is very nice, deep orange color. Uh, and in, it, it, it's very tasty. It's a very tasty and, and uh, enjoyable fruit for eating. So, so like I said, this is uh, this is a project we've been doing in cooperation with the Choctaw Nation, and that's part of a bigger bigger project uh, that we we've had going on for several years now to work with Choctaw Nation, uh, both adults and youth, uh, on growing fruits and vegetables. To number one, to learn how to grow fruits and vegetables, and number two, to learn how to market them. Uh, again, this is uh, this is very rural area, and, and people, many people, uh, need to find ways to make their living off the land and be a crop uh, unique to the Choctaw Nation. And they're trying to develop products and all that could be would be unique. So, so very good products. So we're working with them on that. Now, uh, I'm going to be taking, be making some changes in my career in the near future, and I've been I've been the uh, the the lead person on this project. Uh, having working with adults and, and youth, Choctaw adults and youth, with growing fruits and vegetables, and uh, but but within in a short period of time here, uh, Dr. Shelley Mitchell, from the uh, Hortic OSU Landscape and Horticulture Department, is going to be taken over as the as the uh, the director of this project, <clears throat> and I think this is going to be this is very timely. Uh, one thing that we've, uh, the direction of the project has, has, again, we work with farmers in the area. Each of the county extension educators within the Choctaw Nation have been working with, with uh, through the schools with young people on, on school gardening projects of various sort, teaching young people how to grow uh, various fruits and vegetables and things. And uh, so she, that's, that is Shelley's forte. She's been working with that. Uh, with, with youth education in, in horticulture and, ex and recently has developed some really interesting uh, uh, teaching aids, so to speak, that, that, uh, that, uh, that are going to fit very well with the other project activities here. So, Shelley, uh, it's glad to have you here visiting today. Thank you. And we're really pleased that you've been willing to take on this role of working with the project and all. And well, I hope I can keep up <laughs> with your awesomeness, all right? So I, de I developed a couple of kits we're gonna be giving to the kids, and uh, one is the Gardens to Go kit we've shown in other uh, episodes, and it has 18 activities for elementary children. And then we also have a kit for the older children, which is plantology, and it has 12 activities that are more in-depth. 
So we'll be integrating this into the project with the Choctaws. The county okay. extension agents are also very involved in this project. And so if you're interested in this project, for more information, you can contact your local county extension agent. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Next week, we turn the calendar to October, which means we'll have your monthly hort tips. We've got another raised bed segment and more with Dee Nash that you won't want to miss. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussion on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and Tulsa Garden Club. <music>